The next speaker's name is Alice. She's here all the way from California. She wanted me to let you all know she teaches kids how to code in her free time. I think that's awesome. I try to do similar things myself. That's the spirit of the community we have here in Boston and the greater world. Help me welcome to the stage Alice, who will be speaking to us about paradigms. Hi. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about poor programming paradigms. And we as developers have probably all seen poor decisions being made in the code base. I have experienced this on both sides. When I first started programming, my mentality was to just ship it first, and then I'll clean it up later. But then I would look at the code base a few months later, and I'd be looking at it, and I'm like, why is this so confusing? Who did this? And then I look at it, and I'm like, oh wait, actually, that was me. Whoops. But I started to realize that thinking the big picture is important, and not doing that is dangerous. I've realized as well that developers tend to make the same mistakes over and over again. That's because we look at the code base and we tend to look at other people's code and take ideas off of that. So whether or not those are good patterns or bad patterns, they tend to uh, go throughout the code base. And as the uh, code base enlarges, that means the poor coding patterns also grows more and more. So I'm going to talk to you about four major examples of why I think um, these poor programming patterns exist and um, talk about the solutions that we can have to those poor programming patterns. In order to do this, I have built this demo application. It's super simple. There's only two frames. Um, there's the profile fragment where I first land on, and then I can search up people and I can follow them. Very simple. But what you don't realize is that there's already poor programming patterns that I've embedded into this developer, in this, uh, into this sample application. And if we grew this application to the size of something like Pinterest, then we're looking at something like months to years of tech debt. You can actually check out this code on my GitHub, and you can look at the branches that I've ri uh, written. Um, I have solutions to all of the problems that I'm going to talk about. And you can also diff them at your own time or during the ta talk in order to understand what changed. So let's get started. Problem number one. The first problem is very basic. We have a very simple UI, but for some reason, it's a pain to add new features. Why is this? Well, here's an example. This is what our previous design is. Our previous design said that we're following X number of pinners. And that stays consistent regardless of whether or not it's my profile versus someone else's profile. But we want to change this. We want to change the text to say, you are following 25 pinners, and Ben is following X number of pinners. So it seems like it's just a simple text change. But for some reason, this is harder than I thought it would be. Why is this? Well, when I looked at these screens, I decided that there were common components between the screens. You know, we have this avatar view and description, and that's the same on the pinner fragment and the profile fragment, uh, and my profile fragment. So I decided to combine all of that logic and bring it up into a base class. We have this base profile fragment that's an abstract class with shared logic. Let's take a look at the code. What can we see about this code that might be sending us off some red flags already? Well, number one, our first code smell is that we have these protected member variables. When we increase scope of member variables, that means that we can change them from anything that inherits those classes. So when I'm inheriting the base profile fragment and changing those member variables, that means that I can create, um, I can edit those variables and also create bugs from any of the classes that are inheriting it. That makes it really difficult to debug over time. Our second code smell is that we have logic in the base fragment that can change over time. In this case, we want to update that following text, and we have that logic in the base class. So that means that when we're setting the text of the base class um, and setting the following text, um, we have to move that logic out of the base fragment and into the inherited fragments. That takes a lot more work. And in this case, we have only two fragments that are inheriting the base fragment, and we also have um, this code smell of the fact that we're re-implementing and overriding the logic every single time. So in this case, we only have two fragments. But what if 
we multiply the fragments. It's unlikely that you only have two screens in your app, right? So let's do some A-B tests. Let's add a profile fragment, uh, two versions of that, and then a pinner fragment, and then we have two versions of that as well. That means that we have six variations of the base fragment. This is what we call inheritance hell, and we should really avoid this. So let's think about this um, example again. When we have these common components, does it make sense to use inheritance? When we think about inheritance, we should think about it as an is relationship. Does it make sense for the common components, the avatar view, to be an is relationship with the, um, the fragments that we have? Or does it make sense for those fragments to have the avatar view? When you think about it logically, it makes a lot of sense. It should be that the relationship between the avatar view and the fragments that we have, um, and that should be a has relationship. We should be using composition. So our previous architecture looks something like this. We had the base fragment, and we had my profile fragment, um, and pinner fragment inheriting that. And then our new architecture means that my profile fragment has an instance of the avatar view, and my pinner fragment also has an instance of the avatar view. So what the code would look like is actually, it looks very similar to what it previously looked like, but we made some great updates. Number one is that we no longer have those protected member variables. We have private member variables and the scope is only kept within the avatar view. Number two is that we're passing through custom attributes. And these custom attributes mean that we're making, um, we don't have to update the avatar view every single time we wanna change um, the, the contents of the avatar. So if we want to update that following text to show something different on um, my profile fragment and pinner fragment, that's just a simple line change. We no longer have to take that logic out of the avatar view. So our key takeaway for this problem is that we should be deliberate about inheritance. We should think about composition first. Inheritance should always be intentional. This is something that we have heard a lot in other talks and that it's an effective Java programming practice. In Java, we would actually annotate the class with final, but in Kotlin, that's for free. All classes are closed from the beginning. We should use inheritance when the is relationship makes sense. An abstract example is that vehicles have tires, but a truck is a type of vehicle. And in our example here, we had the avatar view and um, our fragments contained the avatar view. Well, what's the relationship of uh, inheritance in um, Android? Our Android fragment, when we create custom Android fragments, that custom fragment is inheriting um, the Android fragment. So that's an inheritance relationship. All right, problem number two. So, we previously talked about view architecture, and we're going to move on to something a little bit different. We're going to talk about events. So, in this um, example, we have so many bugs related with the follow button. Well, why is that? Here's an example of what our fragments look like. Again, super simple. And when we click on the follow button, we just want to update that pinner, um, the following text, to say that we're following 26 pinners instead of 25, right? But for some reason, as we add more and more fragments, we realize that this is becoming more difficult. We're starting to introduce bugs. Well, the reason why this is happening is actually due to um, a library that we've decided to use. This library is an event bus library. There are many different types of libraries like this, but they all basically do the same thing. There's event bus, auto, <laughs> tiny bus, et cetera. But at the basic implementation level, it is a global event queue. That means that the publisher, which is sending events, is sending events and um, it doesn't know what it's sending it to. And on the other side, the subscriber that is receiving events doesn't know where those events are coming from. This might not seem like such a big deal when it's just with a single fragment talking to another fragment, but as you introduce more and more events, 
this becomes really confusing real fast. So again, when we're sending those events, we're sending it to basically a black box. And we're receiving those events, we're receiving it from a black box. The code looks very simple. It looks something like this. We have the follow button, and when we use event bus, we just create this new event and say that the follow button has changed and we have a new following count. And on the other side, we receive that event and we update the following count. So in this example, um, we have the subscriber and we have the publisher. And as we add more fragments, it breaks. Why is it breaking? Well, there is different life cycles tied to these fragments, and there's also different conditions that we're sending those events. So I might be sending those events um, because I, um, the follow button has changed, but that condition might not apply um, in the same way to another fragment, but we're still sending that same event. And on the, um, on the subscriber side, we don't know whether or not um, those events are, um, uh, whether or not the subscriber is actually alive during the time that the event is sent. So because of the fact that it's a view and um, these views are very tightly, uh, require very tight coupling, it doesn't make sense for us to use a decoupled library. So because event bus is decoupled, it has many pitfalls. One change, one event could change so many parts of the app without you knowing. There is no enforced responsibility of ensuring that something is listing or um, on the other side being sent. And as we add more events, it decreases the reliability and the maintainability of the code. On top of all of that, it's also a pain to write tests for. But I'm not saying that event bus is bad. I'm not saying that you should never use event bus. I'm saying that it doesn't make sense in this scenario. It doesn't make sense when we're looking at tightly coupled logic, um, and that's updating the UI. But for something like sending events for um, logging, it makes a lot of sense to use event bus because we don't care whether or not those uh, events are being sent at all on the client side. When we send it to the server, whether or not that error is out, we don't need to update the UI because of that. So what is our solution for this? Well, our solution is to have an observer or listener pattern. This is something that we've already seen a lot um, before in the code base. Whenever we click on a button, we have this on-click listener, and that's an observer pattern. So we're just reintroducing that to more parts of the code base. We have the simple interface to enforce tight coupling um, between the uh, subscriber and the <coughs> publisher. So in here, we have this follow listener, and it says following count changed. And on my profile fragment side, I implement that follow listener. I also have to register that listener when I'm creating the new fragment. I haven't shown that in the code here, but um, if you look at the actual code um, examples, it's there. And on the follow count change um, event, I'm actually setting the following count. On the actual observer listener, uh, on the actual publisher side, I have to register that listener somehow. So um, I create the method in order to register that listener, and now I have an instance of that the listener. And then when the API callback comes back, um, I have the success of that uh, following count that I have, and now I'm updating that listener and notifying that the count has changed. So our key takeaway here is that event bus libraries are often abused due to its simplicity. UI updates require tight coupling. And so event bus is not a great use case for this. We should use event bus where loose coupling makes sense in logging and performance and things where the client side, uh, where the client does not depend on those events being sent. All right, problem number three. So let's go back to this event sending, right? We were using events, uh, event bus to um, update fragments between um, when we uh, click on the button and come back to it. But when we take a step back, we're looking at this and we're thinking, you know, why is it that we have to send events anyway? 
When I go back to the fragment and you think a little bit more about the view lifecycle, I know that I'm coming back to the fragment. So maybe I could just call the API every single time that I come back and then I'll always have the freshest data, right? But maybe I don't wanna do this because when I call the API that like looks really bad, you have this loading screen, you know what, I just wanna cache the data. And so when I come back to that fragment, I actually have cache data that is waiting for me. So in my screen, what I actually have is I have these instances of the model on every single fragment. So I have um, my profile fragment and it has my user model, uh, but I also need my user model in the pinner fragment, so I have that as well. But I also have the pinner um, model that I gets come back, so I have that current user. So I just have a bunch of model instances everywhere in my views. At this point, what I really wanna do is face palm. <laughs> um, Let's take a look at the code. Um, could we spot some of the maybe bad coding practices here? Well, number one is that we're caching models on a per fragment basis. That means that we're introducing data inconsistencies across our app. When we update, um, when we get an API return um, and we have that new model, that other fragment doesn't have that new model. So now we have to think of hacks in order to figure out okay, how do I tell that new, um, that previous fragment that we now have this new model and we need to like invalidate the cache? The other problem is that we have model dependent logic in our view layer. So we have this like cache and we check that if it's null, then I load that new API. And if it's not null, then I can just use the cache in order to update the screen. So in this example, I'm talking about one instance of a problem with data consistency, but there's actually a lot of different ways that we can introduce data consistency in our app. So this one is UI instances and it has model state, but here's some more examples. We got like global static variables. We all know that this is probably really bad for the code base, but sometimes we just need this hack, you know, like one thing won't be like that bad, right? So we just add it in, no big deal but this is really bad and we can totally fix this. Another example is that maybe we have a utils class or we have the singleton pattern with a helper and we wanna update um, some part of the app, you know, we're reusing this logic multiple times, but you know, actually I need to track the model state somehow, so let's like keep an instance of the model within this utils class. And that's also really bad. We're introducing data consistency, inconsistencies in now our utils class, and we should never store state in our utils classes. So our solution is actually simple. All we gotta do is collect all of those model instances and store it in one place. We have a central area in order to keep, um, uh, in order to store all of our models. So um, at Pinterest, we call this a repository. And what it does is it checks memory cache, it checks disk cache, and it also makes um, network calls depending on whether or not we have that existing model or whether or not we feel like um, maybe we want uh, the freshest model rather than just the cache model. So that solution code looks something like this. We have a repository listener, and that repository listener takes in a model. In this case, I'm using generics, so um, I'm just assuming that it's some model that extends an object. And I have an on success and an on error listener. Within my user repository, all of that logic that we were previously doing in the view, I'm just moving it over and I'm putting it in this um, data layer. So on this data layer, um, whether or not I have the user, I return success on that listener. And if I don't have that user, then I'm going to call the API, and then I'm going to return success on, um, once I get that API's uh, return. So what are good things about this? Well, now we have a central cache check. And number two, we have a central network call, and we're updating the model every single time we're having that central network call, so that cache is always up to date. Um, this is the profile fragment and it's calling the user repository and over here we're just creating a new listener and we're doing a simple call in order to update the view after that listener returns the on success of that model. Cool, 
So this is a very simple example. And there is something called ArxJava. Um, it might be kind of intimidating to hear about this thing. People hear that it's like a lot of overhead, it's a lot to learn. Um, but at Pinterest, we do use ArxJava with our repository. And the reason we do that is because ArxJava, um, it's kind of like an observable, but on steroids. You can do a lot of things with it. And when we have asynchronous communication problems, like having to call the network and also having to ca uh, call cache, and maybe we want to do operations on that, so we want to chain network calls together, um, or we want to make sure that it's, um, or we want to return more than one model, et cetera, or we want to um, perhaps like check the cache, return the cache if it exists, but then once we get back the network call, we also want to return that, um, then that's something that RxJava can help us do. And a listener pattern isn't really um, enough to just do this. So um, just like a heads up that this is not like the best code um, that we can do, but it is um, something that I wanted to make easier for this presentation. Um, and we can also um, use libraries in order to translate network callbacks into RxJava uh, observables for you so that it's a little bit less um, work for you to set it up. But our key takeaway here is that we want to build a central way to fetch and retrieve models. So stop storing instances of your models everywhere. Don't store it in your views, don't store it in your utility methods, just store it in a central area and ensure data consistency regardless of whether or not we're retrieving or storing our models. Final issue, problem number four. So this problem is probably something that all of us can identify with. We have no unit tests. Why don't we have any unit tests? Well, as a developer, I'm kind of lazy. I don't want to do a lot of work. And in our code base, the demo code base that we have here, um, it's a lot of work in order to write unit tests. Um, so because writing unit tests is so difficult, and I just want to do the simple thing of validating that we're actually updating the profile correctly, and it's going to take more work to write that test code than to actually write the profile code itself, I don't do it. And so why is it that writing unit tests is so difficult? Well, this is what a typical fragment could look like. We have our UI, we have animations, networking, models, caching, logging, Android services, you might even have more than just that in your fragment. And what we really want to test is the business logic. We want to test that we're actually updating the views correctly with the models, right? So in our code here, um, in this example, I'm just showing that I want to update my avatar view with the model that I have. And in order to do this, I have to do so many things. I have to, number one, mock out that network callback um, and mock out that implementation. Number two, I have to mock that translation of that response to a model. And number three, I have to mock out the Android framework UI using RoboElectric. And RoboElectric is a pain because it's actually mocking out a lot of the implementation of um, Android frameworks and it's a pain to use. So how do we make this test simpler. Let's imagine what our unit tests could look like. Okay, so maybe it could look like something like this. You know, once I get my user um, and I come back with it, like I could just have the user success and uh, it, when it happens, we validate that this profile is being updated with the correct um, variables and then it's also correctly updating the following text, right? So what is our solution? Well, our solution is something that you probably all have heard of. Um, you've heard of all these paradigms being thrown around, right? MVVM, MVP, um, Gamilla is gonna talk about MVI. And you know, it sounds a little bit intimidating, but actually all of them have a similar thing, a similar property. And that's that they separate concerns um, between things that don't need to know about each other. And whether or not like you choose, um, whether which paradigm you choose is not actually relevant to what I'm going to talk about. I'm just going to talk about the fact that the benefit of all of these um, are that they separate concerns. So now you can communicate between um, 
classes without knowing the actual internals of that class. I'm going to use an MVP example because Pinterest uses MVP. Um, so here we have a fragment and um, we have a presenter, which is our business logic, and we've actually already created this repository in the previous problem. So we've already finished our models. But between all of these, we have contracts in order to um, separate the concerns and make it seem more like this. So when we're actually testing the business logic, where um, the view interface hides the implementation of that view, and the data source hides the implementation of that repository. Now it's a lot easier to test. So um, this is an example um, related back to that previous example where we said um, tight coupling is good. Um, this is an example where we actually prefer loose coupling. And so we're um, you know, like separating concerns because we actually want loose coupling in our app so that it's easier to read and also more testable. So let's see what that code looks like. Um, there's going to be a lot of code shown in the slides, but what I'm really doing is just moving logic around and separating concerns. So number one is that we're gonna create this view interface. And this view interface has two methods. It has the update avatar view, and it has the update following count, right? And then I'm going to implement that interface. So in that update avatar view, um, I've already had this logic. I'm just gonna um, switch it over so that it's actually, um, the, the methods are uh, now implementing it. And so we have this update of avatar view and it's updating the view and the update following count is updating the following text. And then we're gonna define also a contract for the repository. So this um, contract is called the user data source. And we load um, my user and we're also loading the number of following um, of that user and we also pass in through um, the repository listeners. And then um, I'm not gonna show the code for this because we've basically already seen it, um, but uh, we're implementing that data source and that logic is already there, we're just overriding those methods. So this is the presenter now. So what the presenter does is it passes through that view interface, the view interface that um, we previously created that is abstracting away all that view logic. Um, and then also we're passing through the data source. So what does this mean? Well, number one is that we're no longer referencing the repository. When we're doing a network callback, we're just calling back on an interface. So we can easily mock that out. Number two is that we're no longer mocking it in Android view. This isn't an Android view anymore. It's just an interface. It's very easy to mock out. And finally, we're no longer mocking out that network callback. Um, our network callback is just a listener, it's coming back as a model, and um, we're able to very easily um, mock out all of these um, concerns. So it does require an MVP framework in order to function. Um, you can look at my code, but it's actually quite basic because it's just um, covering this um, problem of um, what happens when you have a single view. Um, and in cases like recycler views, et cetera, you're gonna to have to do more work in order to figure out the actual binding of the presenter with the view, um, which I'm not going to cover about, but you should search it up and also decide which paradigm is right for you. So what does a unit test look like now? Well, it looks basically like what we were previously trying to aim for. We have the verification of the view and it, um, we verify that we're correctly setting that avatar um, and also the following text. And um, this is the base um, uh, test implementation and we can see that we're, um, in order to actually mock out those views, all we're doing is using Marquito and we have this mock annotation in order to mock out those um, interfaces. And so, it, you know, it, it doesn't actually require that much setup work and it allows you to write tests fairly easily. So we sold separation of concerns from a testability standpoint, but actually separation of concerns is much more than that. Um, it makes the code way cleaner and it improves understandability of the code. 
you now don't have to look at the view code while you're understanding what the model is doing. And because it's completely in a different file, and it actually like it under, um, it makes the flow of the code a lot better. It also increases usability of the code base. When we have a view that could be um, that is not dependent on the model, we can now reuse that view any way we like. So before we were using it with the user model, but maybe we have a different type of user and that's a different model, and we can reuse that view and bind it different ways and not have to do a lot of logic in order to do that. Um, this is also used in building libraries and making um, your code base more modular. So our key takeaway here is that unit tests are easy when you separate out the business logic. Consider a paradigm, MVVM, MVP, um, they'll stand for model view presenter, model view view model, um, and MVI um, to separate out the concerns and use interfaces to extract away those internals and use a mocking library such as Makito in order to mock out that functionality. And we can improve testability and understandability of the code by doing this. So we made it, that's all. Um, and just as a recap, what are we talking about? So number one is we had these two um, views and we identified that there were common components in the views but we decided to use the wrong relationship to talk about those common components. So we should be deliberate about inheritance and use composition instead. Number two is that we were sending events all over the code base and um, we were using this thing called event bus, which is a loosely coupled library. But we should use tight coupling when we're updating the UI. And um, we should use an observable callback or ArxJava observables um, instead. Number three is that we create a central location in order to retrieve uh, models and make sure that our data is consistent throughout our entire app. And number four is that we separated out all of the concerns through interfaces and that made our code base way more testable. So all of these problems that I talked about, they actually um, are quite basic. And the solution to avoiding these poor programming practices is just awareness. So the next time you send out that diff, think about if you're making any of these mistakes. And yeah, thanks. You can find my slides here and ask me any questions. I think we have time for questions. And yeah, thanks so much. Um, also, I really wanna take a selfie, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that right now. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thanks, guys. Who has questions? Uh, first off, appreciate the presentation and the work that you do with ScriptEd in San Francisco. Oh, thank uh, you. <laughs> wanted to ask you a question about the uh, RX Java event bus, event bus thing. Uh, I'm curious, RxJava has some of the similar classes of sort of challenges that you noted with EventBus. It doesn't necessarily care about who's subscribing to it or things like that. Uh, so I'm curious what you, sort of patterns that you follow in order to uh, prevent those challenges that you saw with loose coupling in EventBus uh, and preventing those from happening in RxJava. Yeah, I think that RxJava does have some freedom in terms of um, sending events, but it still requires that tight coupling, so it still has this observable, and you're actually um, still doing subscriptions to it um, in the code base. And so I think that there, there are some other issues that you might encounter, but like this um, problem of like wanting to have tight coupling is actually not an issue with ArxJava observables. So yeah, does that answer your question? Um, following up on his question, uh, you said uh, it, um, it initially in the presentation you, you, you talked about listener observer pattern. So, uh, like, what's in MVP? In MVP, actually, this is used a lot. Listener observer pattern. So, what's what's your reference using RxJava observable versus listener observer? Or? Yeah. 
So yeah, that's something that we talk about at Pinterest a lot. Um, I think that the benefits of RxJava observables actually decrease if the um, like the actual code is very simple. Like if you just want to notify that something is happening and maybe you don't care about doing operations on it, you just want it to happen one time. Um, it you can basically use RxJava uh, RxJava observables the same way that you would use a simple listener pattern. Um, and so like there is a lot of times in the code base where we just decide to use that listener pattern instead. Um, so yeah. And what if, uh, let's say you want to update the UI on let's say five different fragments. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, so like I think like one of the benefits are, uh, that is handed with RxJava is like it helps you a little bit with the lifecycle um, like management. And so that, like, that is like a benefit. And so um, there are places where we are using like listener patterns um, and we just decide to use listener patterns. It's kind of up to the developer. Um, but yeah, like I, I think like in those cases, I would probably just opt for either and I would be okay with it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so what's your strategy for um, a little bit more detail on the caching? Like how do you how do you mark stuff as like dirty and make sure like the data is consistently presented? Like even if you have like other sources or other devices, potentially like broadcasting events, um, how, do, how do you keep that repository up to date? Yeah, um, it's a complex problem. Um, with caching, I don't believe we ever, if like data is dirty, right now we're not currently um, telling like every single thing that's observing on it that like, hey, like you should refresh this data. But every time that we go back to this data, we have this option of refetching that data and we can decide whether or not, perhaps like we want to um, get it from cache. And also if there's a more fresh data, then we return that network response as well. But I think that, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of up to the company and the engineers to decide whether or not, what kind of um, way you want to do that. Yeah. Do you always try and update models like on the main thread or do you mark stuff as volatile or what's, um, um, how do you protect against these kind of things? Right. Yeah, honestly, that's not my area of expertise. Um, I do believe that we are um, updating it on the main thread, but perhaps we should um, like look into more cases. Um, awesome presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask at Pinterest, do you guys, um, so you mentioned that you're doing uh, MVP and mm -hmm. you have the unit tests that are um, checking the uh, observer subscriber pattern. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any like unit test patterns for like, I don't know, testing observables and the subscriptions that you have with that? Um, yeah, we try to mock a lot of that um, out. So we do have integration tests in order to test actual like um, events being sent throughout the app. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if we can actually test that that well with just unit tests, so. Are you using Espresso for the integration tests, or? Um, yes, we are, yeah. Cool. Oh, there's one over, over there. <laughs> Do you have um, some particular recommendations? You said you were talking about third-party libraries to help convert the network calls to observables. Yeah, I think that depends on what network library you are using right now. Like for example, Retrofit has like a lot of integration with RxJava observables off the bat. Um, and like I, I think like that gets a little bit more hard when you look at like Volley or other uh, network libraries. Um, at Pinterest, we actually do this um, like uh, in-house, and um, we kind of have like a lot of different use cases, um, and we're using like older libraries, so um, we're on like the process of migrating to other newer networking libraries. So yeah. Um, since it seems like there's a lot of interest in RxJava, um, 
Do you have any, have you found any pitfalls working with Rx Java and with the, the views, the Android, um, the main, not the fragments and activities and stuff? And do you have any interest, uh, do you have any experience with um, live data? Um, no, I've never tried out live data. Um, yeah, I think, I think the biggest pitfall, if you would say, with RxJava is just that it can be fairly complex and there's all these like kind of words that they're throwing around that doesn't make a lot of sense in the beginning. Um, there, when I first learned RxJava, um, one of our coworkers um, showed this website called Arx, uh, RxJava Marbles or something, and that kind of allows you to understand at least what the operations are doing. Um, yeah, I would start small. Um, we started with our networking layer first because that is what like the most benefit we would receive from RxJava. So yeah. Cool. Thank you. Hi, uh, first of all, thanks for the great talk, uh, really helpful. Um, I had a question regarding the inheritance versus composition. Seems like yeah. it's like a forever debated uh, thing that we all do at our workplace, whether we should use inheritance or composition. Um, uh, and uh, I appreciate that you've shown one use case. Uh, do you have perhaps, or uh, can you list out more uh, such, you know, uh, points when, like, clearly we should we should have, you know, gone for the composition versus versus inheritance. I know that it's awareness thing, but uh, I'm just asking you whether you have experienced certain other times when you would use one over the other. Yeah, I think the hardest part with inheritance and composition is just that it seems very easy to just inherit something because you already have that class and then you're just like oh I just want to add this like few couple of logic um, and doing composition actually requires you to refactor that class into something that composes of smaller things yeah. um, and so I think like even within like Pinterest like we have views that this happens but we also like in presenters like it might actually make more sense to compose presenters rather than inherit presenters and um, we kind of like yeah, it's hard to catch sometimes. Like, um, you kind of just have to like watch out when you're inheriting something and really think like, am I actually using this correctly? Should I actually be extending this? But yeah. All right. Thanks. Cool. Next question. Hello. Uh, so you said uh, you have to prefer the compound view, making new compound views is better than inheritance. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this case, maybe uh, we have to inject uh, different presenters. So uh, there is a third solu solution for that. Um, are you talking about injecting presenters and views? Yeah, for the fragments, uh, there can be two presenters with the same fragment. Oh, I see. Um, right, yeah, so I am actually using two different presenters with the two views. Um, whether or not you want to actually reuse those presenters is up to you. I think in this case, um, because I'm using two different network calls, it wasn't kind of apparent, but I am actually using two different network calls, that it didn't really make sense to reuse that presenter again. Um, but yeah, I, I think like that's like another benefit of going with something with like MVP where you can actually reuse the business logic as well as the view logic. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks guys. Thanks.